um, to deliver a plenary talk on sustainable seas, the Tuba Taha experience that has welcomed Paso Angelic Murato Songo. I'm Angelic Songo. I'm the Protect Area Superintendent of the Tuba Taha Reefs. I've been working here for the last 20 years. So the Tuba Taha hasn't known any other superintendents but me. <laughs> Tubataha is a major source and sink of larvae of corals and fish, and therefore it uh, contributes to the food security of the country. It is used as a standard for the study of fish and coral reef communities in the Philippines. We have uh, lots of turtles. Most of them are juveniles, like the ones in this picture. 80% of them are juveniles. It's a juvenile developmental habitat for turtles. Most of our turtles... Uh, come from other nesting sites. It is also known to have the highest density of white tip reef sharks and gray reef sharks in the world. And it's a habitat for cetaceans, for whales and dolphins, and a stronghold of seabirds in Southeast Asia. Tubataha also contributes to the local and national economy through scuba diving tourism. That was before the pandemic. It is being managed by the Multi-Sectoral Protected Area Management Board, composed of uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the Plant Council on Sustainable Development, the Armed Forces, the Academe, uh, people's organizations and NGOs also have a voice in the management of the park. So JC already mentioned, uh, oh, there. We're in the Ramsar list of wetlands of international importance. Tubataha is a particularly sensitive sea area. That is the MPA equivalent of the IMO, of the International Maritime Organization. We are also a member of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, we're an ASEAN Heritage Park, inscribed in the World Heritage List in 1993, the first in the Philippines. And in 2007, Tubataha was named as one of the best managed large, no take marine protected areas in the world, together with the US and Colombia. Yes, but when we, we were established in 2001, the Tubataha Management Office, and when we were just beginning and finding our way, you know, we did not know how to manage an offshore reef. And uh, our early challenges were stakeholder distrust for park authorities. I think we also distrusted ourselves because we did not really know what to do. There was insufficient coordination among the managers. There was uh, non-compliance was an issue because uh, it's a very rich fishing ground and, you know, fishers wanted to get their hands on those fish. Funding was very uncertain also at the time. And so I'm here to talk to you about how we, we responded to this and the, how our issues emerged and in the end, uh, what lessons we learned through the years. We, met, we kept communication lines open with all the sectors. We had uh, consultations with fishermen's groups. These are, are from other offices. We also consult with the dive operators and the tourism sector. Also, where possible, we make participatory any rulemaking in the park. For example, rules that have to do with operations. How many dive guides, how many divers can one dive guide uh, assist uh, questions like that, you know, those operational questions, those we can negotiate, but then when it comes to protecting the environment, they are all non negotiable, non negotiable. And we have kept our promises in, in 1998. Our first meeting with a multi sectoral group, mostly uh, fishers, they promised that they will not fish into Bataha, and we promised. Uh, the municipality of Cagayancillo and its fishers that we will continue to. Uh, hire people from Cagayan Sili when we need them, that we will provide a certain percentage of our uh, fees that we collect to them. And we have kept those promises throughout the years in the same manner as the Cagayan Sili LGU has kept their promises to us. Uh, we had a lack of coordination in management. And so uh, when the multi-sectoral policymaking body was uh, established, it was, an, it was a venue for people of different mandates and, and uh, capacities to come together yeah, and talk about uh, what is good for Tubataha. We crafted a management plan with the stakeholders. We always meet with them because we, 
we wanted to know what their aspirations were. In the end, we found out we had the same aspirations, and that was to keep Tubataha alive. We also built capacity to manage. As I said earlier, none of us had uh, any idea uh, you know, how, how places like this so far away and with access very seasonal, how do we manage this? Where do we even get the funds to, to manage a, a place like that? You know, things like that. And together also with our uh, stakeholders, we identified indicators of, of success. We asked ourselves, what does it look like to be successful in managing Tubataha? And we said, as long as we still find the fish that communities are there, we have maintained coral cover and, and you know, and many other things like uh, seabird populations, those are indicators of success. Uh, Non-compliance was an issue. As I said, we consulted with fishers and there was, there was a, a point when there was no stopping uh, fishermen from coming in. They were not taking fish. They're actually taking shells because the shells are more expensive than the fish. It's called the top shell, Trochus niloticus. I think it's called Tectus niloticus now. And so we had a lot of fishers. We almost sent to jail 500 fishers in a, in a short span of, of time. And so we had to provide our enforcement people with the proper equipment to do their jobs well. And they say that morale is 95% uh, of enforcement. So if your people are low morale, then they won't enforce regulations. And so we try to keep morale by, I think they know that we care about them. Uh, we give them the supplies they need. We give them the equipment they need. And you know, we're, in, we're in contact every day. That's why they call me Mama Ranger. I think... One of the reasons also is that I nag them <laughs> all the time. And so we also applied sanctions consistently. Not one of the fishers that we arrested got away scot-free. We sued everyone that came uh, and did illegal fishing in Tugataha. We also have uncertain funding, which is, uh, I think, everyone's uh, problem. We charge 100 dollars in conservation fees and that is what we use mostly as the video said to, to fund the park we also sell merchandise and we one of the merchandise you'll see there on the lower right uh, are plushies that the women of Cagayan Silio make and that we sell in the park you will see that Tubataha is in the highest denomination of the land it's in the, it's in the 1000 peso bill Ironically, we are in short supply of those bills. And so we apply for grants and donations uh, every year from uh, various sectors, the private sector, mostly. Next slide, please. And so if you see our tourism revenues in 2019 was 374,000 US. And this year it was 1,700 US. It's the same for all the other parks that, uh, that I have, uh, managers that I have talked with and so, uh, we have to prevail and find a way to fund our parks despite of this um, major problem. Next slide, please. Now, our challenges have, have uh, emerged. Our new challenges include uh, coral bleaching. This coral looks so beautiful and immaculate. It's actually in the throes of death. And when we went back after two weeks, three weeks, it was covered in algae. It was already brown and it was, you know, just beyond saving. And we've had, uh, our waters have been warming for the last 40 years. And in the last 30 or so years, we've had six major bleaching events. Last year, we lost almost 20% of our corals to coral bleaching. We also have a problem of erosion of the seabird islet. The storms are becoming more often, they become more intense. And the wave action that uh, hits our islet is causing the erosion among other reasons. Yes, another, uh, so for, in response to our uh, problems with our islets, we lost the trees as well. And so our, our nesting, tree nesting species lost their habitats. And so uh, we fashioned this uh, temporary nesting structures for them to nest in. We bring in nesting materials we, because there are no more trees, there are no more leaves for them to make nests with. So we bring nesting materials as well. The only thing we couldn't do was to lay the eggs ourselves, but we are taking care of them because we know we cannot lose them. Next slide, please. Marine debris is another major problem. 
if you look at the pictures at the upper left, these are marine debris floating uh, on, the, on the water surface. Most of them are discarded fishing gear. They say that 10% of marine debris are made up of fishing gear. And this is what we have here. And it's not just fishing gear. It also includes, it's covered in grease and you know some, some oil product. And if you look at the upper right, it's a brown booby. Tubataha is the only place now where you can see brown boobies. And this brown booby has a helmet of a plastic cup it's a plastic glass and it's wedged in its mouth and it has not been able to uh, feed, of course, because of this. We couldn't catch the, the brown booby and so we know that eventually it would have died. And this is a really, really sad scene. While diving in, in one of the sites in Tupataha, we saw this juvenile gray reef shark. Its head is in a plastic bag, the one we use in our daily lives. And it had drowned. And during that same trip of five days long, we saw two other gray reef sharks with ropes around their bodies. So, you know, that's how bad it is. So what did we learn uh, from the field? Or should I say the lessons we learned from the sea? Can we go to the next slide, please? It takes a constellation of actors to manage our MPAs to manage nature even. I think that, can we just go back to that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, this is a photo of Tubataha at night. Look how beautiful it is. There is nothing to obscure the constellations and in the same way, uh, I think that is how we, we should look at it. There's nothing to stop us from being partners with, with whoever. We've had a Chinese restaurant owner help us to prosecute cases. We have students who, who write us and design you know, buildings or whatever for us, you know, we cannot write anyone off. We need more partners because conservation is an inclusive project. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. We need science to make sound decisions and to engage the public. And so our decisions need to be science-based and that is what we have done in Tubataha. This is a photo that was taken during our study of uh, Napoleon Ras. Uh, Tubata has the highest density of Napoleon Ras. It's uh, this one is about one and a half meters uh, long, and also the results of science we translate to layman terms and use that to engage the public. And next slide, please. I cannot read it, but then it says down there that it's about partnerships. Yes. Okay, that was about partnerships. That's a, uh, that was a Barakuda and a diver. This one, nature and people are dynamic. Therefore, we will not run out of challenges. We know that uh, management is actually uh, working in the, in the social realm <laughs> rather than in the ecosystem realm. And so when we put these two dynamic things together, it really is a, a, an incubator of challenges and and it's just it. And as managers, it's our job to solve problems and, and uh, respond to challenges. So we merely buckle up, we roll our sleeves, and we face whatever challenges there are ahead of us. Next. Yeah. And once in a while, we get together to celebrate our wins. Thank you. Now, we don't forget what, why we do what we do. And it's for these children and it's for the future generations of humankind that we do this. That's it. Thank you very much.